Okay, so now we're going to look at the diversity of life. So first, some disclaimers or information. The trees we're going to use are a combination of those on the Tree of Life web project, which is a website that's contributed to by researchers who are doing systematics and phylogenetics, and a paper in Science from 2001, which is the phylogeny of the mammals. So in truth, phylogenies are constantly being tweaked and refined, and so some of the details of the following trees may be in dispute, they may change, there may actually be two different phylogenies that different groups of researchers argue with each other about, which is the accurate one. So the phylogeny you get in other courses may therefore differ in some of the details. That's just what happens when you're in the process of figuring out what nature has done. Okay, so first up, when we took ribosomal RNA, so this is RNA that everything uses, right? All living things um, have ribosomes. When you sequence the ribosomal RNA sequences at, from basically everything, 600 different species, you get a relationship that looks like this, where bacteria are mostly in one big group. Kind of surprisingly, archaeobacteria were in their own separate group, and then eukaryotes are in a third group. So we're kind of surprised. We sort of didn't really expect archaeobacteria to not be right in there with all the other bacteria. It's not really a surprise that eukaryotes are different from bacteria. But if we look at this, really this tree is just bacteria, archaeobacteria, and eukaryotes being different from each other. We don't really know what the root of that tree is, right? So is it the common ancestor, this last um, universal common ancestor here? Then there's a divergence where archaeobacteria is the outgroup of bacteria and eukaryotes. Or are bacteria the outgroup of eukaryotes and archaeobacteria? or eukaryotes, the outgroup of bacteria and archaeobacteria. Just from this ribosomal RNA, all we have is this pattern. We don't know which of these three trees is the more accurate one. So using duplicated genes, the duplicated before the divergence of all three of these taxa from one another, and this is a technique I talk about a little bit in the molecular evolution course that I teach. Using this data, we can actually put the root of the tree right here and so the actual shape of the tree is bacteria as the outgroup for archaeobacteria and eukaryotes. And that was actually kind of a surprise, right? We didn't really expect archaeobacteria to be more closely related to eukaryotes than they were to bacteria. So of course, follow-up studies have shown that there are also other biochemical aspects of metabolism that are more similar in these two groups than either is to bacteria. So we have the root of the tree of life occurring right here. We have archaeobacteria and eukaryotes as sister taxa, and bacteria as the outgroup. You can also represent a phylogeny with a circular diagram like this, where the root of the phylogeny is at the very middle, and we can see the branching pattern spiraling outwards. This is one for bacteria and archaeobacteria. This is one for animals. One of the nice things about this phylogeny is it indicates that basically everything has been around the same amount of time. You don't have anything on the edge of a phylogeny versus in the middle. So you should be aware that sometimes phylogenies, especially phylogenies for very, very large numbers of species, are depicted with these sort of circular diagrams. I prefer these diagrams here. They're a little easier to learn with. So this phylogeny here is the phylogeny we'll be looking at. We'll look at examples of all these different taxa on the tips of this phylogenetic tree. There is a separate PDF that has just this image. It's available for download that you'll want to use to study. You can read all these with great detail. But this tree is also incomplete. There are lots of groups that are not shown in this tree, either because they're extinct or they're alive and they're not major groups. Also, these branch lengths are not necessarily to scale, so the fact that this length here is less than this length here is meaningless, right? I've just made this in a way of kind of organizing it all. So this phylogeny here is a really nice outline of life as we know it. You're responsible for knowing this phylogeny for exams and assignments. And one of the reasons that I have this phylogeny in this course was a couple reasons. First of all, it's nice to see how life is related all in one figure. And second, I actually remember when I was an undergrad, I never actually got a tree like this, right? So I learned all this stuff all about all these different organisms, learned about evolution, learned about ecology, but I never really had this. So I decided to give it to you so you guys can have the experience that I missed out on. 
Um, for example, the things like, well, where are dinosaurs, right? Dinosaurs are a big deal when you're a kid, and then you know you grow up and everybody starts talking about them. Well, dinosaurs are here, right? They're this little group here that went extinct, but they're in the middle of reptiles, in the middle of amphibians and, and mammals. Although this is kind of a daunting phylogeny and it's a lot of information, as you're studying this and thinking about it, you do also want to take a little bit of time to kind of step back, look at it, and take it all in with the realization that this is some of that wonder of life. Life laid out in one diagram in a way where we can understand the history. All right, so the first section of this phylogeny we'll look at is eubacteria and archaebacteria. Eubacteria is the outgroup to archaebacteria and eukaryotes. So eubacteria, these are true bacteria. Their cells have cell walls. They don't have nuclei. And we can also really consider mitochondria and chloroplasts to be descendants of eubacteria because these organelles are the results of a symbiotic relationship between a eubacterial organism and the eukaryotic organism that it infected and then became a symbiote with. So we can often understand mitochondria and chloroplasts better by thinking about them as being bacteria. And then archaebacteria, they look a lot like eubacteria. Microscopically, they're all single-celled. They tend to live in unusual places, geothermal springs and the intestines of animals. They look just like bacteria, but when you start analyzing the biochemistry and metabolism and genetics, then you can actually see they have more in common with eukaryotes than they do with eubacteria, despite their kind of superficial physical appearance. Moving on now to eukaryotes. So eukaryotes have nucleated cells, and this is where we get true multicellularity, right? There are some examples here where sets of cells will kind of stick together, but all the cells are exactly the same. There's no division of tasks. Within eukaryotes, we have true multicellularity where there will be an organism made up of more than one cell, and the cells do different things. So within eukaryotes, we have three major groups. We have green plants as the outgroup to fungi and animals, which are a monophyletic clade there. And this was actually another one of the big surprises from phylogenetics. I mentioned earlier we were kind of surprised that eubacteria and archaebacteria weren't more closely related to each other than they were to eukaryotes. A second surprise was when we started making phylogenies, we totally expected fungi and plants to be more closely related, maybe animals to be the different one, but that's not in fact what we see, right? We see plants branching off earlier, and then this common ancestor here branching one set of descendants becoming animals, another set of descendants becoming fungi. And again, when you analyze some of the details of metabolism, you can see that there are more similarities between fungi and animals than there are between fungi and green plants. All right, so what do these guys look like? So fungi are mushrooms and yeast, so toadstools and mushrooms, and also yeast. So one of the reasons why we study yeast so much in biology is because it's a eukaryotic organism that's more closely related to us than any plant that we could grow would be. And it's single cell, so it grows quickly, so there's actually a lot of research using yeast because, again, they're more similar to us than Arabidopsis or E. coli or anything like that. And then they also do useful things like make beer. So what do plants look like? You live in LA, so you don't get to see too many plants, but there are plants all over the world. Green plants includes algaes, mosses, ferns, and seed plants, so gymnosperms, which don't have flowers, and angiosperms, which do. I'm a little bit of an animal biased person, so we're not going to great detail about the diversity within plants, but there is, in fact, a huge diversity within green plants, and we could easily have another phylogeny for plants as big as the one that you have in this class for animals.